Uh, good afternoon again. Thanks for joining our last session of day one. My name is Rachel Schaefer, and I'm the Seattle Policy Manager with Cascade Bike Club and Washington Bikes. Welcome to the Washington Bike Walk and Roll Summit. Um, we're excited to have you all with us today, and we're thrilled to see so many people joining us from communities across the state, um, and like I said, beyond. Um, we would like to start with a land acknowledgement. The summit is virtual, and those participating are joining us from many lands. Both Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes are two statewide organizations, and we acknowledge the land our offices in the Puget Sound sit on today as the traditional home of the Duwamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Suquamish tribal nations. If you don't know whose land you are on, you can look in the chat in a minute where you'll find the link to a map where you can look up uh, your place on the land. Without these communities, we would not have access to this environment, and we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. I'll also note that we are recording this session and it will be available after the summit is over. The summit is hosted by Cascade Bicycle Club and Washington Bikes, two sister statewide organizations with a shared vision of a safe and healthy future where bicycles bring people together, eliminate inequity, and create thriving communities. We want to take a moment to thank our sponsors whose contributions have enabled us to bring together 14 panels with expert speakers. Um, and with registration free for everyone who's attending. So thank you to the Washington State Department of Transportation, Columbia Bank, and DRO. Now I'll introduce our session, which is Complete Streets Requirements for State Transportation Projects. We're gonna be hearing from Celeste Gilman and Kenneth Lowen, both from the Washington State Department of Transportation. Um, in order to improve the safety, mobility, and accessibility of state highways, this year, state legislature uh, directed WashDOT to incorporate principles of complete streets in state transportation projects. So we're going to learn about this tremendous opportunity and how you can plan for complete streets improvements in your community as part of future state transportation projects. Uh, we'll have around 50 minutes for a presentation, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, um, and we'll try to give as much time as possible for questions as well, because I imagine we'll get lots of questions from this session. So as you think of them, please put them in the chat, and we'll have someone gather those so that I can uh, present them to Celeste and Kenneth at the end, and we'll have a little discussion. And then the last thing is, uh, towards the end of the session, you'll also see a chat with a Google form where you can provide feedback on this session, uh, which we greatly appreciate. And now I will stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Celeste so she can start sharing and uh, go on with the presentation. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. So again, Celeste Gilman, I am the Strategic Policy Administrator based in the Active Transportation Division of WashDOT. And I am leading our overall uh, implementation of this new Complete Streets requirement. And with me is my colleague, Kenneth Lowen. Uh, yes, hello everyone. I am Kenneth Lowen. Um, as you can see on the screen, I am the active transportation lead for the Northwest region of WashDOT. Um, I recently took this position maybe about six months ago, um, coming from a background in the private sector um, doing bike and ped uh, planning and engineering. Great. So to start us off, I complete streets are about providing facilities, planning, designing, building, operating, and maintaining streets that provide safe access for all users using all forms of transportation, all ages and abilities. As illustrated in these this sort of collage of, of photos from examples across Washington state. And there's a lot of wonderful momentum that's been building uh, around complete streets here in Washington nationally. And that makes sense for all the many benefits that complete streets can provide. We can move a lot more people in a given amount of space when people are walking, biking, and using transit. And rather than, than driving, which takes up a lot of, of real estate for each unit of mobility. So that spatial efficiency also has, uh, it opens up opportunities for, for other uses uh, of that, that space for things that matter to people. There 
also, as we know, many environmental benefits to having a more balanced transportation system that gives people options for how to get around uh, in ways that do less to contribute to the climate crisis. And having that um, or balanced transportation system provide more safety and options uh, for, for everyone. And critical component of that is having the facilities that really make walking and bicycling inviting and accessible to a broad spectrum of, of the population. Where we lack those facilities, then people need to be very brave or traveling out of necessity. But when you provide those quality facilities, then that creates an environment of dignity for those who are already traveling using active modes and creates an environment in which we can kind of unlock those mobility and equity and safety, uh, environmental benefits of significant use uh, of active transportation. Oh, across the state, we have many jurisdictions who have already adopted complete streets policies. That's what's represented in this map uh, are, are those uh, adopted policies across the state. And uh, as an agency, complete streets are very much aligned with our direction of our strategic plan, our vision for Washington travelers to have a safe, sustainable and integrated multimodal transportation system, our goals around uh, transportation system resilience, diversity, equity, inclusion, workforce development. What is new is that a uh, requirement that was passed as part of Move Ahead Washington that directs us that in order to approve the safety, mobility, and accessibility of state highways, it's the intent of the legislature, the department must incorporate the principles of complete streets with facilities that provide street access with all users in mind, including pedestrians, bicyclists, and public transportation users, notwithstanding the provisions of RCW 472420 concerning responsibility beyond the curb of state rights of way. That last clause there uh, refers to uh, jurisdictional boundaries uh, associated with, with curbs and is of a uh, points us in the direction of the critical partnerships that will be needed to, to implement this, uh, but that we have a responsibility even if it involves work beyond the curves of state rights of way to see that complete streets are provided. And this applies to state transportation projects starting design on or after of July 1st of this year that are 500,000 or more. Oh, as we are applying and implementing this new requirement, we are taking that uh, universe of projects over 500,000 starting at that commencement date of July 1st uh, of this year. And we are looking at them to, uh, to, to look at the context. And if those projects are in incorporated cities, then they will be moving forward for a uh, complete street uh, analysis. And there are also other places that have land use patterns that are of a similar character to incorporated cities, but aren't incorporated. So we're looking at those areas as well and looking to see have we in our planning work and our statewide active transportation plan or in a regional plan, have we identified that there are active transportation gaps in, in our facilities? Or have our partners identified that there are active transportation gaps? If so, those projects will be moving forward down the complete streets track. And finally, 
We are also looking at uh, are those projects occurring in overburdened communities and recognizing that those communities may have been uh, particularly challenged to do the planning work to identify that there's a gap, but a gap may be present that uh, in those communities will also move those forward for complete streets implementation. We have adopted a set of guidance to support the implementation of the new requirement. And within that, I uh, clear, clearly identified that we have the flexibility to look at the space that's already occupied by transportation facilities and look at using that space in different ways and that can have, have that latitude, have that flexibility where appropriate, where, as developed uh, in partnership with, with local communities to potentially reduce the size of vehicle lanes, the number of vehicle lanes and reduce vehicle speeds. So the legislation speaks to some of the qualities and elements of a complete street. So those include Americans with complete and Americans with Disabilities Act accessible sidewalks or shared use paths. And got some examples here of places where uh, that's not currently complete in our system or is complete for that element. Uh, that includes uh, bicycle facilities in the form of a bike lane or adjacent parallel trail or shared use path. Oh, example of not complete and complete. And that in locations where there's a posted speed in excess of 30 miles per hour, it's not enough to have you know, a bike lane and, and a sidewalk, uh, that there also needs to be a, a buffer or physical separation from vehicular traffic where those uh, the speeds are over that threshold. Oh, example of not complete and complete. And then the final quality that's, that's called out in the legislation uh, is that those locations uh, that have a design that hampers the ability of motorists to see a crossing pedestrian with, without sufficient time stop given posted speed limits and roadway configuration. Uh, so example of not complete and complete. We're uh, continuing on, critical in this implementation are those local partnerships working together to identify appropriate solutions and how facilities uh, added to state routes connect up with a larger network, uh, including um, intermodal connections and the, the role of, of speed, uh, direction explicit in, in the legislation to adjust the speed limit to a lower speed with appropriate modifications to roadway design and operations to achieve the desired operating speed. Uh, and an emphasis here on a safe system approach, which Kenneth will, will speak about more. So this, all adds up to we will be on many state transportation projects, planning, designing, and constructing facilities, providing context sensitive solutions that contribute to network connectivity and safety, pedestrians, bicyclists, and people accessing public transportation. Oh, I'm going to go through a few frequently asked questions and uh, these. So applicability, currently this applies only to state transportation projects uh, over that cost threshold of half a million dollars. So if we are out there for a state transportation project, uh, this could be any number of project types. Uh, certainly a, a paving project is sort of a classic example. Um, but any 
other project type that we uh, have uh, a triggering purpose for us to be out doing work if it is over half a million dollars and uh, in that appropriate context, uh, we will be fixing the gaps in the active transportation network while we are out there. There are other types of projects with uh, a WashDOT nexus, uh, projects funded through our grant programs, projects implemented by others on state transportation facilities. At this time, this requirement does not apply to those other types of projects, but we will be looking at each of those in turn and uh, we'll be doing uh, our group will be doing appropriate stakeholder outreach and, and uh, yeah, looking at the uh, flexibility implications, um, ability to consider those other places with the WashDOT nexus. Um, and if this requirement is extended to any of those other scenarios, there will be a clear commencement date and or communication um, around that. So currently it only applies to state transportation projects. The funding for this is from the, the projects where Complete Streets will be implemented. This is structured as a baseline requirement. So uh, where we'll be applying Complete Streets, uh, there will be a process to uh, adjust the, the, the scope and uh, as needed the, the budget for those projects. So this is included in the, the funding that's provided from the legislature for this work. We have a significant backlog in funding for state preservation projects. And there, this is or the, the, the reality that we get to work through uh, is we will be looking for uh, those opportunities. Uh, and Kenneth is always quick to point out that Complete Streets projects don't necessarily have to cost more, um, but those opportunities to, to implement uh, Complete Streets solutions cost effectively so that uh, we can meet the objectives of this requirement, provide those quality facilities, and continue to make progress uh, on our significant preservation backlog. Also, along with that, I uh, schedule. Uh, there are, we have many, many tens of and uh, hundreds of projects over the coming years to, to deliver. And so we are working very collaboratively within WashDOT. Uh, to identify those appropriate solutions to, and the critical piece is that, that partnership with local communities. And the very best thing is where you, as the local communities have identified uh, what's the, the goal that you would like to see for your state facilities, how you would like to see Complete Streets implemented, that you've done that, that vision and planning work so that when we come through with a transp state transportation project, um, we can quickly uh, roll that into the project delivery process and, and construct that, that vision. Um, again, those having that flexibility to, uh, to look at the space that we already have devoted to transportation in different ways is going to help with all of those things. And uh, maintenance responsibilities, uh, the legislation also identifies that this is per uh, existing law. So this doesn't change maintenance responsibilities, but this is going to change what infrastructure is out there. And uh, we we'll wanna work closely with jurisdictions 
from early in the process, uh, probably establish maintenance agreements just so that there's clear understanding for all the parties of uh, what those long-term maintenance um, responsibilities will be. Oh, I've said it multiple times, but just to uh, re-emphasize the absolutely um, foundational critical component in all of this is those partnerships. This is a tremendous opportunity for bringing really meaningful uh, improvements to, to communities across the state. And it's very important that what gets implemented is, is supported and, and consistent with what uh, is desired with, within those communities. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Kenneth to talk about uh, some of the uh, approaches and tools and resources that, uh, that, that we're accessing and encourage you to also um, uh, utilize as together. We seize this opportunity for some transform transformational change here in Washington. Kenneth, over to you. All right, thanks, Celeste. And I'm going to apologize up front, um, fighting a bit of a throat issue today. So hopefully, my throat or my voice holds up uh, for the rest of the presentation. Um, okay, so as Celeste said, I'll be talking about some of the tools and resources that WashDOT's going to be using for our complete streets work. And I'm going to start um, by talking about one of the key principles that we're going to be using to measure the effectiveness of our complete streets work. And that's uh, this concept of level of traffic stress. And I know um, given the audience today, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with level of traffic stress, but I would still like to go through some of the inputs that um, feed into how we calculate LTS. So, but before I get into the details of LTS, um, for this first slide here that you see on the screen, uh, I first wanna talk through the idea of um, separating bicyclists into different types. Uh, and then talk about how each of these groups responds to stresses associated with riding uh, by their bicycle in their traffic. So this is, again, probably something that a lot of you are already familiar with. Um, back in 2006, Roger Geller proposed the idea of categorizing bicyclists into four groups, and those four groups you see on the slide here. So if you look along the bottom, kind of lower right portion of the slide, starting from the left, uh, the four groups that, that he identified were a group, uh, the highly confident group, that's the one in kind of the blue or blue. Um, these are bicyclists that are willing to ride uh, virtually anywhere. And then another group is somewhat confident. Um, I think Roger's label for this was a little bit different. I believe it's uh, um, interested, uh, or sorry, <laughs> concerned, but enthused, but interested. And then the next group, the interested but concerned group. Um, this is uh, one that I really wanna focus on. And then the last group, the group of, of people that are just not interested or not able to ride bicycles, are, that's the non-bicyclist group, which I would claim is probably not a group of bicyclists at all. So um, the graphic on this slide, I wanna point out, it comes from the city of Denver, but the, the splits that you see here are pretty consistent for studies that have been done in cities around the country. So this is, this is pretty consistent with other cities as well. So let's look at what each of these splits looks like. And I'm gonna start on the left side of the slide here with the non-bicyclist group. So again, this is the group that's either not able to or not interested in riding a bicycle. And in virtually all um, studies that have been done, this group comprises about 25% to about a third of the total population. Um, so that's, that, that's a group that's just not gonna be interested in riding a bike. And again, generally about a quarter to a third of the population. So if we go around to the next group, the highly confident group, and again, uh, Geller refers to this group as the strong and fearless group. Um, Denver's study here uses slightly different terminology. So this group usually falls somewhere between about 1% and 7% of the total population. And again, this is the group that they're going to ride their bike anywhere, um, regardless of whether bicycle facilities have been provided or not. 
And then the next group here, which is labeled somewhat confident, and um, Geller calls this the enthused and confident group. And this group pretty consistently falls between about 10 and 15% of the total population. And this is the group uh, that will ride their bicycle on streets where bicycle facilities are present. Um, they may prefer trails, depending on the individual. So if you take those two groups together, the highly confident and the somewhat confident as labeled on this graph, that really uh, represents the majority of people who are already riding their bicycles for transportation at least some of the time. So then that leaves the last group, um, the more cyan colored blue, and I've left it for last because it's really kind of the key takeaway on this slide. And that is, uh, this is the segment of the population that would be interested in riding a bicycle for, for transportation if better bicycle facilities were available. And again, the, the percent split of this group is pretty consistent in, in almost every city, and it usually lies between 50 and 60% of the total population. And I, I just want to pause on that for a second. So between 50 and 60% of the total population is interested in riding a bicycle, but currently don't ride a bicycle because of lack of facilities. So obviously that is a very big untapped potential ridership uh, group that we'd, we're really interested in, in getting um, more participation out of. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now that we've talked about bicyclist types, let's talk about LTS. So um, level of traffic stress, again, this is probably a term that most of you are familiar with. This was introduced by uh, Peter Firth about 10 years ago, and it's really been adopted as a means of measuring the performance of bike facilities as an alternative to more traditional engineering approaches like levels or volumes or things like that. So um, the inputs for the level of traffic stress, those are shown, uh, not, they're not super clear on this graphic, apologies for that, but they basically consist of the number of travel lanes, the speed of traffic, number of vehicles, the presence or absence of a bike lane, the width of a bike lane if it's present, and then the presence of some type of um, separation or barrier between the bike lane and traffic. And this, when you uh, apply this analysis, you, you end up with uh, LTS one through four that provides a scale of one through four. Now, if you think back to the previous slide and as shown on the lower part of this slide, it's really tempting to say, oh, we've got four types of bicyclists, we've got four LTS levels, let's correlate the two together. Uh, it's not quite that simple. They, the, the two do kind of line up at the upper end, but there's a couple differences to really pay attention to that are uh, illustrated here on this slide, but I'll describe a little bit in a little more detail. So first, um, remember that the one cyclist type is the person who's just not going to ride a bike. So that group doesn't correlate with LTS. They're not going to ride a bike no matter what you put on the street or a trail or anything. And then the second thing to, to know is the, the previous slide that separates bicyclists into four types. That's all based on research that's done by um, adults that are self-identifying as one of those groups. LTS, on the other hand, tries to get um, children involved in the most comfortable facilities. So recognizing that some children would be able to use facilities at the LTS one level. So if you look at the four LTS levels shown here, you're gonna see that the big green group of cyclist types, that interested and concerned group that we talked about on the previous slide, this is the group that's really, uh, they'll, they'll consider riding on LTS2 or LTS1. So that's really the target that we're trying to get to is LTS2 and LTS1. Again, trying to capture some of that latent um, interest that's in that particular group. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. And then this slide, uh, just a little bit more graphic interpretation of the four different LTS levels. So you've got LTS1 on the left, um, moving through LTS-4 on the right, and then a little illustration of what each might look like um, on the street and the type of rider that would be, or the percentage of riders that would, would fall into each of these categories. Okay, next slide, please. All right, shifting gears a little bit. So <laughs> um, I wanna talk a little bit about safe system approach. And again, 
I'm, I'm sure that this is a topic that many of you are already familiar with. So a safe system is a way of thinking about how the design and operation of a roadway can be changed in a way that reduces the number of crashes that happen and also changed in a way that reduces the negative outcomes of crashes when they do happen. So obviously this approach supports uh, principles of vision zero or target zero, whichever your agency, whichever term you prefer to, to use. And the first slide here, I've got two slides on safe system. This first slide looks at several different ways to reduce the number of crashes. So avoiding crashes, um, some of the tools that can be used working from the left to the right here, obviously separating users spatially. So providing a separate place for bikes, pedestrians to be separate from um, higher speed vehicles. The second one, separating users in time. And this uh, works in conjunction with separating users in space, but provides separate, in this case, separate signal phasing, for instance, so that um, users are not occupying conflicting spaces at the same time. And then lastly, increasing the attentive and aware attentiveness and awareness of all users, um, especially at points of conflict, which is where crashes generally occur. Um, okay, next slide, please. And then the second component of the safe system approach is managing the crash kinetic energy. And this recognizes that um, humans are humans and crashes will happen no matter what you do. Um, so if when those crashes happen, we want there to be the best possible outcome um, and some tools that can be used toward that end are shown here. So on the left there, managing speeds, the most obvious one, reducing speeds, uh, either through a variety of different tools, whether it be speed limits or changes to the design of the roadway. Um, and then the second one, managing mass difference. This really relates back to uh, spatial separation, particularly on very high speed roads. Um, providing some kind of a bar solid barrier uh, so that when a vehicle does lose control, they will not encroach into the, the bikeway. And then the third one here is managing crash angles. And this, the, the illustration really looks at uh, vehicular crashes and the way that roundabouts change the orientation of vehicles so that when crashes do occur at intersections, they're between vehicles that are, that are, pass that are traveling essentially in the, right, the same direction. Okay, next slide, please. All right, and so the last kind of general concept I wanna talk about before we get in more into the guidance is talking about strodes. And <laughs> I know this is a term probably, again, many of you have heard before. So the term strode obviously is a mashup of the two words street and road. So then the question is, what is this, what's this term trying to convey? So uh, let's, we can think about what the terms street and road mean individually. And it kind of is illustrated here um, on this diagram. So a street on the left side, generally it's some type of public thoroughfare that provides access to local properties, usually within communities, generally lower speed facility, many points of access, um, and again, serving mostly local traffic. So I, I like to think streets generally serve places and capital places with a capital P, like a, a place that is somewhere. So on the other side, the road, on the other hand, generally these are more public thoroughfares that serve as access between places. So generally higher speed, much fewer access points, and really meant to provide a way for traffic to get from one community to another. So then you think about, well, what does that mean as a strode? Um, a strode really is an attempt <laughs> to combine both of these functions of a street and a road. But frankly, they obviously rarely do either of these functions very well. And I know we all can think about um, examples of strodes, especially when you look at the diagram here. Generally, these do tend to occur more in suburban contexts. And I think the picture here, here kind of tells the story. Again, we can all relate to this type of um, development. So you've got lots, lots of access points along a street. The street's got five, six, seven lanes. Access points are generally serving large parking lots rather than uh, leading directly to functional uses of property. 
And so obviously we see these everywhere. And this type of roadway really presents a, a major set of problems for cyclists and pedestrians. So it's something we're really trying to tackle. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now, again, sorry, shifting gears one more time. Uh, let's talk a bit about implementation of complete streets. So the first couple of slides here, I'm gonna talk about strategies that agencies can use when they're developing their own complete streets implement implementation policies. So this first slide illustrates one approach, which is developing standalone guidance documents. And I've got three examples here, one from the city of Tacoma, city of Boston, Montgomery County. Um, this approach really, in this strategy, the agency, an agency really develops complete uh, individual separate complete streets document guidance guidance documents that are used to supplement the remainder of their of their standards and guidance. Uh, next slide, please. The other strategy um, is to actually pull complete streets principles into all of an agency's broader guidance documents. And I think two local examples uh, really do this well. One is City of Portland. One is City of Seattle. Not surprisingly. Uh, these two cities really lead the way in complete streets in this region. And so for both of these cities, they've they've really baked in complete streets principles in their in their broader guidance documents. And that's a really effective way to do it. I'm going to try and speed up a little bit because I see we're running short on time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm going to really quickly go through a few best practice guides. Uh, the first slide here is obviously ADA guidance. Um, ADA is naturally a legal requirement. So this guidance is very important. Really the best sources for the design guidance are the, the um, PROAG, which I'm sure everyone's mostly familiar with, and as supplemented by the 2013 Supplemental Notice of Proposed Rulemaking for Shared Use Paths. So these two documents together provide really good design guidance. And then the legal framework is defined by the 1968 1968 ABA, the, obviously the 1991 ADA, and then the 2004 ADAG, ABAG guidance or standards and the 2006, 2010 um, standards that you see here. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the next few slides, I'll talk a little bit more about best practice guides that have been published over the uh, past few years. And I, I do wanna caveat this by saying, this is definitely not an exhaustive list by any stretch. Um, also not meant to be taken as an endorsement by WashDOT, but really just um, to illustrate there is, there is a lot of guidance out there available for folks to use. So this first slide here looks at uh, pedestrian facility design guides that are out there now. Um, the AASHTO guide, which just came out last December, is obviously a very good one. Portland's guide that I just referenced um, and SDOT's Streets Illustrated guides are both good. And then the FHWA Accessible Shared Streets Guide from 2017 um, also provides really good pedestrian facility design guidance. Uh, next slide, please. For bicycle facility design, there's a ton of uh, new material out there and it's really fan getting fantastic. <laughs> uh, so right now the Ashdo Bike Guide is a little long in the tooth. It was last published in 2012. That's the upper left corner there. There is a new uh, greatly revamped version that's due to come out uh, very soon, hopefully knock on wood 2023 that will be published, which will greatly expand on uh, the guidance that's in the current guide. And then the other guides I've got listed here, which you can reference later, obviously the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide, which I'm sure folks are familiar, familiar with as well. MassDOT has a, a really fantastic and comprehensive separated bike lane guide published back in 2015. ITE also has a protected bikeways guide, protected bikeways, separated bikeways, kind of interchangeable terms. And then the FHWA bikeway selection guide, uh, which we'll be using here in WashDOT to help inform the way we select our bikeways. Next slide, please. And then uh, for multimodal accommodation, I've got two resources listed here. One, the FHWA Achieving Multimodal Networks publication and the second one being the NACTO Transit Streets Guide. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I wanna to touch on this Ohio DOT Multimodal Design Guide, which just came out in April. 
Um, really fantastic, very comprehensive guide. I think it's somewhere north of 400 pages long. And I, I like to reference this one because it is a DOT, a state DOT that has published this. And so this is a really a, a great um, reference for us to consider as we move forward with our own standards. Next slide, please. And then uh, just briefly gonna touch on a few tools that can be used. Um, this is probably familiar material for a lot of you. So one of the key tools for um, achieving LTS-1 and LTS-2 is making sure that you're um, designing in traffic calming into the design itself. And there's uh, any number of ways that this can be done. There's, this just gives you a, an idea of some of the um, primary tools that are used for traffic calming. I won't go into detail on these, but just um, acknowledging that there is a, quite, a, quite a number to choose from depending on context. Next slide, please. Another tool, and uh, this gets back to what Celeste um, alluded to. What, so one of the things I mentioned is just because you're adding bike facilities does not mean you need to be adding pavement. <laughs> so lane narrowing, especially on these strodes in particular, is a really good way of finding space, quote, quote unquote, finding space for um, a bicycle facility. And just a couple of ways that that can be achieved are shown here. Um, narrowing the, and, and the reason I say this is having gone through a number of these in the past, what we often find is particularly on these uh, wider roads, there, there, there is often um, what I would characterize as excess width in, in existing lanes. And so kind of reprogramming that width into um, more active transportation use really achieves two goals. One is it acts as traffic calming in itself just by narrowing the lanes. And then obviously providing that dedicated space for, for bicycle facilities is a great outcome. Next slide, please. And lastly, for the tools, um, again, another tool that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the standard uh, road diet as it's called. So in this case, looking at a four lane to three lane conversion, using the extra space that you've um, taken from that fourth lane and dedicating it to bike facilities. And I'll touch on this a little bit later as well. Next slide, please. Okay, um, <clears throat> a little bit of a shift, shift of gear again, back to guidance. Celeste is working on this NCHRP 15-78 guidebook. And this guidebook is going to be uh, providing inf uh, a way for designers to think about um, how a roadway cross section can be reallocated and reconfigured. So this is coming from NCHRP. This is gonna be a fantastic resource as well. I think it's due out pretty much any day now. Um, and I, we, I think, uh, Celeste, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to mention about this <laughs> or we should move to the next slide. Next slide. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay, um, lastly, I just am gonna go through a couple of example case studies really quickly. And the first here is a small town, Duval, Washington, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Washington uh, State Route 203 runs right through the center of town and it is the main street of Duval. So the image you see on the screen here, this was obviously a um, street view grab from 2007. One of the issues that Duval had been dealing with at that time was traffic speeds through their downtown. And this really functions as the main street of their town. This is where all the activities and uh, retail and everything else is located. So they had tried a variety of different things, kind of the traditional approaches, enforcement, um, signing. You can see if you look really closely in the center of the screen at the intersection, they had marked a crosswalk there. They had put up the kind of traditional crosswalk signage, they even had a crosswalk sign overhead. None of this was really very effective. And you can kind of, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious why. There's just a huge expanse of pavement here. You've got two very wide travel lanes. I, I think they're somewhere between 14 and 15 feet each lane. Um, you've got parking lanes on both sides and then kind of an undefined space between the parking and the lane. So not a lot of visual friction for, to encourage drivers to go more slowly. Next slide, please. So they came through um, and they made some major changes, which were very effective. And so 
this is really in line with complete streets principles. You can see what they did. They, they narrowed the lanes. They put in curb bulbs. They put in contrasting pavement for the crosswalks. They striped out a bike lane. Um, and all of this has been so effective. They haven't, you can see, they actually took down the crosswalk signage because it was no longer necessary. And the other thing I like to point out about this is they didn't remove any existing uses. They didn't remove any parking. They didn't remove any turning movements. They were able to, to make this substantial change without affecting existing use, which is often um, a competing discussion when you're talking about complete streets changes. And I see we're uh, coming up to about 10 to five. So perhaps I'll just call it, I <laughs> call it good there. We had one more example, but um, this is probably good. Thanks. So we'll very briefly see those sort of the time lapse. And we have uh, a number of uh, references to resources that we'll put in the chat. We do have a uh, Complete Streets web page, and that includes a link to this project delivery memo, which is a key document that describes how we're implementing Complete Streets. Uh, there are a couple of other conferences coming up, including a day session in the uh, ITS Washington. And key part of the implementation of Complete Streets is that we have established teams in each of the regions, and uh, these are the, the leads for uh, each of those teams, and then kind of some of my contact information. So we'll stop sharing there, and we'll put those resources in the chat and uh, look forward to answering questions. Thanks, Celeste. Thanks, Kenneth. And yes, I was just about to say, great idea to put your email uh, directly into the chat box so that uh, if we don't get to everybody's questions, then they can follow up with you via email. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions, some of which are really specific to the requirements. Um, and I'll just start off with the first one. Um, this is regarding one of those complete streets requirements with lots of identifying clauses. Um, regarding the complete streets requirement of identifying facilities on a state route within a population center that has a posted speed of more than 30 miles an hour with no buffer or separation from traffic, uh, for bikes and peds. Is that linked to a guideline that would advise local agencies to incorporate buffers into their standard construction details? No, so, uh, so currently this, this requirement is only for state transportation projects. Uh, the, the project delivery memo that I referenced uh, is, or it's a, a in terms of our standards, the uh, our design manual is is uh, one of our core sources of standards, and the project delivery memo is a, a tool that we have when we need to implement uh, something more quickly. Then we can update the design manual. So it's it's uh, it it's a quick quickly updatable form of standards uh, that complements and where needed supersedes the design manual. So uh, do encourage you to, to take a look at uh, what we have in our, our project delivery memo. This, in terms of, of local community standards, uh, as we are uh, doing our implementation and, and developing standards here at, at WashDOT, very happy to share those, and, and they may provide some uh, inspiration, but uh, they're not part of, of this requirement. Okay, thanks. Um, what role will WashDOT take as a stakeholder or an influent or influencer where a city or a transit agency is doing a capital project on local right of way at an intersection with the state highway, um, assuming that project meets the $500,000 limit, which I'm assuming it would. Um, yeah, what's that relationship look like there? Go good, ahead. Good, good question. Uh, so it sounds like the, the, the question is that there would be a, a state facility involved. Uh, currently, there, the, the complete streets requirement 
would not apply to a project that's being undertaken by others, by a local agency, transit agency developer. Um, that, that is something that we're going to be looking at. We'll be working with stakeholders uh, and, and considering that where you know, we would be approving or we would be in the position of approving the work or, or funding the work. Uh, but that is is a work that's still ahead of us. We, ha we haven't done that yet. Uh, certainly uh, encourage that uh, coordination with, with the appropriate region. And uh, so many of things, these things are, are project by project. Uh, and you really have to, to look at, at the local context. All right. Um, Kenneth, I think I'll, I'll direct this next one to you. Um, how far out of the roadway envelope will WashDOT look in order to make that active transportation connection needed to fulfill the Complete Streets Directive? It's a very good question. So um, we're really looking at corridors um, and not so much necessarily the street itself. And so it's all very, very context dependent. <laughs> Um, so it's hard to give a straight answer to that other than to say there may be cases in which we would be looking outside the roadway prism at a parallel path as a, a more appropriate way to um, incorporate active transportation facilities. Hopefully that gets to the question. Yeah, if I could just add add to that, no, the, the goal really is complete networks. So now, if there are uh, facilities that that already exist that provide that low level of traffic stress and and good route directness, so using that that facility doesn't require a lot of out of direction travel, then that could uh, meet the, the 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 spirit of of the requirement. Uh, we recognize this is something that, that we uh, discuss in the state active transportation plan that I've by, 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 by the, the, the nature of, of traffic volumes and other factors, uh, our state facilities aren't, you know, may not be that you know, very inviting environment for adding active transportation facilities. Uh, we are also uh, focusing in on those, those facilities where uh, it's, it is functioning like a city road and, and how to um, work with the local community to, to make that um, a more uh, balanced facility that, that provides for the, the needs of people walking and, and bicycling. Uh, so, with each each project, uh, we'll we'll be working with the the local stakeholders to uh, look at the work that that we're planning to do, the extents of that, uh, and and the context, and to you know, figure out what what is that appropriate solution there. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of context is needed on a case by case thing uh, basis. Um, Early in your presentations list, you mentioned a couple of um, qualifications and someone is asking, how is the boundary for overburdened communities determined? Um, is it by census tract or, or something else? So we are, uh, we're, we're using the uh, environmental health disparities map that was produced by Department of Health uh, and, and Looking using that to um, identify I've, the higher higher ranking communities is the, the more overburdened communities. Um, we're also looking at some of the, the federal measures and try to take an inclusive uh, approach. We're wanting to the, the the purpose of having that is is in the process is is to and make sure we're not inadvertently uh, leaving out communities that there's there's a strong need for for these facilities. 
Um, I like I like this question about Strode. So um, Kenneth, I'm wondering if you can answer what tools are available uh, for a Strode where the speed can't be reduced under 35 miles an hour and uh, right of way limitations prevent making a separated bike lanes? Such a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, again, it's without knowing the details of the site, I can only speak in generalities, um, but this would be a case where we would be thinking about uh, lane narrowing as an option or even reallocation um, according to that new uh, guidance that's gonna be coming out that Celeste is working on that I mentioned. Um, parallel routes are another great option depending on the context. So um, there's, it, it really, I don't wanna give a rote set of answers to a, an open-ended question that I don't know the specifics, specifics for. It's, it's, I guess, what I want to concentrate on is mentioning that it's really context dependent. Um, so if you need help with any specific locations, we can definitely help with those as well. And I could just add on to that. I, one, one of the things that's, that is going to be a, bit a key to, to success in the implementation of this new requirement is, is we have built into our guidance uh, and our process, the, the flexibility to have more of the factors be variables. So to allow the speed limit to be a variable, to uh, allow the right of way to, to be uh, a variable and so that we can um, really put all the options on the table and then work with the community to, to find what's, what's the preferred option for for that context. Okay, so it sounds like the, uh, the asker of that question can um, definitely follow up with Kenneth and Celeste and get a little more guidance on that tricky situation. Um, we are almost at five o'clock, so I, I wanna get us to more questions, but um, I also wanna let us finish our day at a reasonable hour. So I will just reiterate that their contact information is in the chat and um, also on the slides and you can um, follow up with them separately, um, as well as I think Kenneth was putting in the regional contacts. Um, so you can find the washed out person that's closest to wherever you may be joining us from. Um, and thank you all again for joining us and thank you to the panelists for providing us on lots of information on these new complete streets requirements. Uh, also in the chat, you'll find information on tomorrow's session that starts at 8.30. And last but not least, please fill out the feedback Google form um, that helps us figure out what we should uh, keep discussing and, and sharing in future summits. So um, well, I just noticed someone else had a last question, um, but this, uh, just to repeat, the presentations will also all be available as recordings after the summit um, in case you want to go back and look at all of the great tools that Kenneth was, was talking about. Um, and with that, I will let everybody get out at 501 and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone.